Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our action-packed all-female leadership Saturday in the Leading Through the Pandemic Virtual Summit. I am your host, Kaylee O'Keefe, the founder of Soul Excellence Publishing, and I'm so excited to be joined to bring us home for the day by Dr. Vivian Cintrone. Vivian is on the American Red Cross board, and she is also a geneticist and molecular biologist. So <laughs> Vivian, you're so impressive. I'm so excited to have you here. Welcome. Where are you joining us from? Thank you, Kaylee. I'm so glad to be here and joining this amazing panel. I am joining from Indiana today. Very cold Indiana. <laughs> Yeah, we've gotten a lot of cold weather updates from all of the leaders today. It's uh, It feels like it's been a long winter in some places. So. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm, so, I'm so thrilled to connect with you on this conversation. Uh, having reread your chapter, there's so much for, for us to dig into. And I'd love to, to just start with you taking us back to about a year ago now and your you come together as a head of a task force with the American Red Cross in Indiana and start to realize like there's this big thing on the horizon. What was that first <laughs> that first meeting like for you with you and all of your colleagues? Yes, Kaylee. That first meeting was like a big cloud mm -hmm. coming in front of us. Um, we were all together on that boardroom sitting in front of each other and not even thinking what was ahead of us. We were just listening to the news that this virus was just coming here to the States and um, it was on the West Coast and all of a sudden it was in New York and we were just receiving guidelines uh, at the Red Cross from nationwide from the CDC and we have to put in place uh, some opportunities to help any kind of uh, public health issues, anything that was in place at Red Cross was ready to go. But how? Because we have never faced anything like this. And when we went across, there was a huge, huge opportunity that we have never faced. So as we were across the room, there were no protocols because the previous protocol was H1N1, mm -hmm. and it was not even surpassing to the level of this pandemic, very contagious, very transmissible, and very spreading, uh, spreading very, very fast. So there was an opportunity here to move into quick protocols, how we were going to respond very fast. And that was the opportunity to put together this task force for COVID-19. And when we were around the, the board, we were looking into the transmissibility of COVID-19, how Red Cross was going to help the community if we were not going to face the community, uh, how we were going to respond to the community if we were going to not give a hand or facing the uh, as a first line of responders. So that was going to be very difficult. So again, moving with the protocols that were established with CDC and how we were going to adopt those from the Red Cross National um, Headquarters and how we were going to interpret those into the Indianapolis chapter, that was a huge opportunity. And everybody was looking to each other how we were going to do these in very fast time. So the uh, the task force was able to do this very fast. So we were able to convene every week to go over those protocols, how we were going to help individuals in shelters, how we were going to provide alarm systems, how we were going to do blood donations, how we were going to mobilize to respond to any kind of fire and provide shelter. Uh, all these small details that they do seem small, but amid of a pandemic and the transmissibility of a virus will be a huge, not only uh, detrimental for, for the Red Cross volunteers that could get uh, in the front line uh, contracting the virus, but also spreading uh, into the community itself. You know, that... 
that first meeting and you're all trying to sift through <laughs> the information and people are, are looking to you for a lot of answers or at least interpretation because of your background. And um, you write in your chapter after that meeting, you say, after the meeting ended, I drove back home. I felt incredible emotion, a feeling of the unknown, a fear of the fu future and uncertainty I have only felt once before in my lifetime during the events of September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. As I was driving home through the streets of Indianapolis, I started to see the faces of people in the cars next to me, faces of desolation and despair. The streets were almost vacant, like a winter storm alert where only essential traffic is allowed on the streets. And this was only the beginning of the pandemic. How long was this storm going to last? And I, I just love that paragraph because it, it to me, like I could so feel where you as a leader coming from this, like, all right, we're going to have to do something. And then to see the reality of what was happening around you and feel like, OK, this is scary. This is unknown. But I'm also in a position where I'm going to have to act. I'm going to have to step up. I'm going to have to lead. It's it, it's so powerful. Let let me ask you, you mentioned a few of the ways where the Red Cross, although maybe hadn't seen something like this before, really did step up. And I love the example that you share with us in your chapter about blood drives specifically, because one of the things that we all felt this year is like we couldn't come together and be like, yay, let's help everyone out. It was like, do, do your best by just staying at home and doing nothing, which runs so counter to our spirit to act and to serve and to help. So talk to us about the specifically the blood donation aspect that you led and had to innovate a ton on to actually make happen in this past year. Yes. Thank you, Kaylee. Yes, uh, exactly. This was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic in February when we started to see all these collapse of the blood donations. By March, we started to see the blood um, banks starting to have a low impact and schools were closed. All these big gymnasiums donations were not happening anymore. And all those events were canceling. And we needed, amid of the pandemic, we needed that blood donations, not only for individuals that were um, having treatments, there are individuals that are at risk of treatments and they need those kind of donations continuously donations of plasma and several other types. So um, the community was trying to think what could be a safe way to offer these kind of donations? We don't have schools, we don't have gyms. What could be offered to the community? How can we do these? And thinking about alternative ways, and this is how we take these, uh, when you bounce, and then of these adversities, and then you move forward. Um, like the day gives you lemonades, and then you make uh, the, the day gives you lemons, and then you make lemonades out of it. So, what can you do out of it? And yes, we had uh, mobile stations. We have these uh, buses, and you can utilize those to do blood uh, donations. But they're very minimal. You can only have one at a time. And you don't have that community huge donation experience. You cannot accept that huge donation at a time. So something that um, actually step out of of the of the brainstorming session was how about if I utilize social media and then send an invite to at least my community around the community and see who could be able to donate in the community. I thought, well, maybe nobody wants to get out of the houses. We are, I mean, we are in the pandemic. Maybe everybody is afraid to get out of the house. Maybe nobody will get out of the house. I was so surprised, Kaylee. People actually emailed me immediately or they telephoned me and expressed, Vivian, I just wanted to do something. I felt that I was sitting here watching the news and I wanted to do something. And I was so glad that your communication came through next door or social media. And I was able to say, yes, where? 
And I thought, oh, I don't, I don't have the wear yet, but I will let you know soon. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is, this is pure, what you just did is pure startup genius. You know, you first put out the invitation and then people have said yes. And you're like, oh, okay, now we have to create the thing. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, yes, we have the members of the party, but we don't know where the party will be. <laughs> so immediately I started uh, communicating with the members of the Red Cross. And these are members and they're incredible in make things happen. The staffers, the regional directors, they mobilize uh, everything. And immediately the director of the region said, Vivian, there is an idea. What about if we can convert a store in a mall that is totally empty and utilize it as a biobank and utilize it to have a safety uh, organized opportunity for individuals in the community to donate and come in a specific appointments and have a safeguards, safety, thermometers, everything mask, everything distance, I offer all the CDC guidelines for donations. And I will say that will be perfect. Even better, it will be free of charge for the donations. So immediately, all the Red Cross staffers and volunteers, they start mobilizing the, techn the technicians, the nurses, the um, the administrators that will be able to greet and meet the volunteers, um, all the individuals started to make it happen. And I thought, wow, this is an enterprise and it's just by emails collected on social media. It is like a mini industry all of a sudden created in life. It was in a matter of days, Kaylee. I couldn't believe it. And then in a matter of days, everything was set up and I was able to send the information. So more than 300 individuals, I said, yes. And it was a yes, a solid yes, that they all came through the appointments and they donated the blood and they were super excited. And it was more than excitement that the next door, um, the next door restaurant, they they had a small pizza place and he felt so grateful to see people coming and going into the empty mall that he was so excited. He started uh, giving gift cards of pizzas <laughs> to everybody that was volunteering for, for donations. And that was amazing. And then after that, he was so excited that he started giving away pizzas. <laughs> So it was it was becoming a great opportunity to know the community. Everybody in the community um, was saying hi in distance, but at, at least greeting each other from the distance and knowing that they were there for each other in in this pandemic. And if, if there was somebody in need, not only from the community, but whoever was in need. They were there to donate their blood, to, do, to donate their platelets, to donate anything that was available. Mm -hmm. So it was a power of bringing together the community. And it was not only myself, it was a huge army of these amazing individuals in the Red Cross that made it all happen. But behind that, it was the power of the community, of the power of individuals that wanted to do something for the benefit of of uh, the human being so it is amazing how a human being gets motivated to do something good for another person amid of a pandemic it's it's so inspirational and i think it's such a powerful reminder of it, it was also the result of having a vision and and saying we can bring together people yes. in a new way we can solve a challenge and you know, I'm feeling just really inspired hearing this example because I do look back on this past year and I feel like so much of the messaging of the last year, like I was alluding to, was just like, stay home, shut up, don't do anything. <laughs> Anything you do is going to be fraught with risk and really, really horrible. And it's so demotivating. And I actually worry what does it do to a citizenship uh, or the citizenry when that's, that's our mode of being is actually to step back. 
And you created an opportunity for people to step forward and to find common cause, to tap into that American spirit, to help, to show up, to give. Mm-hmm. And it it's just so powerful. And I think it shows the difference of how things could have been messaged or what we could have been called to do uh, maybe at an even broader scale this year. So what just what an inspirational example of, of oh. that need to help or desire to help. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. And again, it was not only me. I think it was a whole, the entire community wanted to do something. Well, it, it has to be right. Like these things are yes. the power of the network. And so um, yes. and I want to encourage people to read your chapter because you give quite a few other examples. <laughs> the same thing, providing opportunities for people to to help, which is just that like we want to help in moments like this. So read Vivian's chapter to learn all of the examples. But I want to shift gears and talk about we're we're now moving into you know more of the vaccination phase of of the pandemic. What are you, what is the American Red Cross looking to do right now to support those efforts? Yes. So um, I am also now moving into phase two. So the Red Cross is um, organizing, the Red Cross here in Indiana is organizing into a coalition of vaccination. And this is a very important coalition, Kaylee, because it's attracting all the main organizations here in Indiana to bring education about vaccination to uh, talk about education, about the real, the real aspects of the vaccine, mm-hmm. how the vaccine works, how exactly will be the, um, the difference, the significance of the vaccination, how it is made, what will be the different um, significance of uh, the different aspects that you, how you will feel, but not only from the boys, of an organization, but maybe perhaps from vignettes of individuals that have already received the vaccination. And this will be from members of the community, specifically from African-American community and Latino community. And these are communities that are are really in need of this kind of education because at some point they do not receive the exact education They do not have the facilities to receive the uh, potential opportunities of this specific communication, which are the truth versus the myth. And displaying all these organizations and empowering community reverence, community leaders, teachers, the churches, every single leader in the community to get the education to, um, to, to the audience Mm -hmm. and get that empowerment. That's what we are doing for our African-American community and to our Latino community. And again, with our own individuals, with our own members in our own language. So everybody will identify with our own heritage and can answer and can ask questions and can be answered by physicians in our own heritage, our own language, and can be answered by scientists Mm-hmm. Um, and can be able to uh, be able to to answer any kind of debunk any kind of myths that are for this vaccination and empower the real education so individuals can have the opportunity to decide when it's time for them to be vaccinated if I have the decision in my hands to be vaccinated or not and to take this vaccine or not but most of all to prevent the death in my family or to prevent the death of another member in my community. So that's the power of the Red Cross, creating that movement of coalition of organizations and empower them with real education all together to specifically specifically go to these communities that are in disadvantages and then spread the word of the real education. And that's one of the points that I'm doing right now with other members of the of the Red Cross team. Well, it seems so needed and it's exciting that we've moved into that phase where, you know, we're now talking about a vaccine. When when you look back at 2020, what is what's the biggest leadership lesson that you take away for yourself? Yes. I think the leadership lesson is um, 
nothing is impossible. I think the most, I think frontiers is what get us going. Mm. Adversities is what get us going. Nothing is impossible in this life. I think if we have these obstacles, we can jump them. We can overcome them. There is always a way to overcome these adversities. We can always, we can step up, we can step back a little bit, think about how to do them, but we can always move forward. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. The world has always find a way to move forward. Mm -hmm. And we will always, as a humanity, we will always identify it that way. Mm -hmm. I love thinking about frontiers <laughs> and the next frontier and that pull <laughs> toward the frontier and motivating us to be more, to do more, to live more boldly. Oh, I just, I, I love it so much. And I want to ask you why, why it felt right for you to, to write your chapter, to share your story, given everything that was going on in your world. Why, why did it make sense to, to write a chapter, become an author? Yes, it, it, it makes sense for me because um, I do believe in the power of humankind. I do believe that the existence of humankind is for a purpose. I do believe in science and I do believe that evolution is for a purpose. Humankind has the purpose to spread the science and to spread the knowledge. And I do believe that humankind would always find a way not only to uh, conquer these, this world, but many other worlds. I, I do believe that has um, the opportunity and I do believe that's that's uh, one of the opportunities that we will we will not only our future generations will be able to see, but many many other generations. Mm. I want to, um, as we're nearing the end of our time, I one of the things I love about your chapter is, um, well, let me put it this way: you have a soft spot in your heart for the American Red Cross, which goes back for quite a long time. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, there's a story behind behind the Red Cross. And the story, it's about um, an old lady that told this young lady to go and help the Red Cross. And during this storm, this young lady met these policemen during the Red Cross storm and they help all these needed, uh, those, all these individuals that were in need during the evacuation of the storm. And they ended up meeting each other. And many, many years, they got married. And the end of the story is that they um, ended up married. And uh, I am the, the generation of their marriage. So those were my parents. So um, they ended up getting together getting known uh, as a Red Cross, volunteering as a Red Cross event and volunteering from their heart and the Red Cross. So that's why Red Cross is so important for me. And um, growing up in uh, the island of Puerto Rico, Red Cross has always been there to help uh, everyone. Uh, La Cruz Roja is always there uh, from child everywhere to from uh, giving food, water, clothing, um, even um, learning how, I do remember in public schools, learning how to brush your teeth. The Red Cross was uh, teaching all of us how to brush your teeth. Um, all those aspects, La Cruz Roja was always there and my parents always were telling me, if you ever encounter yourself in another territory or somewhere, always go to La Cruz Roja. <laughs> They're always there to help you. So it is deep in my heart because my parents met um, because of La Cruz Roja, mm. but always I feel passion to help my community or any community in the world through Red Cross. And I know they would just be so proud of you for sharing your story, 
for becoming an author, for putting yourself out there in a way that I know wasn't entirely comfortable. You know, you really found your voice and your courage to share. And I know that they would be super proud. And um, that story is just, it. it's so touching. I'm like, who I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Vivian, as, as you look ahead to, to the next year, what is your intention? What is your hope? What is your aspiration for where you go next? Yes, um, I have done a lot of things in my life, but I will like to continue helping more people, either networking individuals with other members, but also helping patients or helping more people, having the cap capability to change lives or to touch lives. That's something that I really, I'm looking ahead. I. I made a point, point in my career that um, I really want to touch more lives. Um, there's a point in your life that you really have accomplished a lot, mm -hmm. but you really want to help more people because those individuals, they are either really very young or they are in the middle age and then they really want to have more direction and they want to accomplish so much. And I think that's the generation that really will impact us or will make more um, footprints for us. So leaving that legacy and those members will leave our legacy in, in, the, in the footprints, I think that will be great. So that's what I'm looking forward. And you have all of the all of the gifts and tools to do it. You have your Thank generous you. <laughs> art, your geneticist background, the biology background, the hardworking mentality from being in the U.S. Army and National Guard. And I would say now you also have the talent of, of storytelling and of writing and of being able to add that to your arsenal as you continue to help others in the year ahead. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you to you that made all these possible. I didn't know that I was able to write this um, kind of information and thank you for the opportunity and the guidance. Um, hopefully many more might come, but <laughs> this was a great opportunity and I enjoyed very much. Oh, well, you are so welcome. And um, I'm grateful that you said yes, that you shared your wisdom with us. And it's just been so fun to, to reconnect yes. live on a Saturday, to hear different parts of your story. And I want to thank you and thank everyone for joining us for a jam-packed day where we've learned so much from the incredible female leaders. If you haven't read the book, definitely check it out, buy your copy, leave us a review. Vivian, thank you so much. Thank you, Kaylee. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Happy Valentine's Day. We're sending you lots of love from Soul Excellence Publishing Headquarters, and we'll see you back on Monday for some more live interviews. Thanks again, Vivian. Thank you.